543, chapters 48 and 49 of The Tenant of Wildfell Hall. Book talk starts at 1310. Welcome to Cracklit. The podcast for crafters who love books. My name is Heather Ordover, and I'm podcasting from where the Delaware River meets the Old York Road, New Hope, Pennsylvania. Episode 543. Stressed? This episode of Craftlet is brought to you by you. Thank you. Well, hello. How are you? I am well. I... I'm wondering if you might be in need of a stress toy. Yes, yes I am. I have no memory, actually, if I've already mentioned this Etsy store before. And if I have, I apologize. But I did want to share this with you. I think I told you Thing One, also now known by his actual name, Aaron, because he is 20 years old. Aaron has a job at a cave, giving cave tours. In fact, he got a really good Facebook review yesterday, which was so cool. He works at Lost River Cavern, and it's really fun. It's also right up there near Bethlehem, home of Bethlehem Steel. And one of the girls at the cavern, who is another one of the tour guides, she saw him with his plastic neon-colored fidget toy and said, you know, my, my boyfriend makes those. And Aaron thought that was really nice. And the next day she brought in like five or six different versions and had Aaron play around with them and then gave him one. I thought that was very kind. And it was really cool because it's two steel rings that are about an inch in diameter and then threaded on each of those rings are dozens of very small, very smooth, little steel. They're not really washers because they're thicker than a washer. But I guess they function the same way as a washer. They're round and they have thickness and they thread onto things. It creates this double rolliness in your hand. (laughs) I don't think that's a word because you can, like you would with a worry stone or anything like that, you can rub over these stainless steel rings and it's just smooth and it warms up in your hand and it makes it feel soft, which doesn't make any sense whatsoever because it is steel. And, you know, I was just thinking if you're feeling stressed, I have put a link to the Etsy store in the show notes for this week. The store itself is called Floppy Links Fidgets, F I D G E T S. And he's got some really cool ones, some made out of very clean bicycle chain with rubber grommets on them. So, again, smooth, kind of soft, strangely soft fidget toys made of steel. So it's kind of like a cool historical tie-in and at the same time, something to help keep you calm. Not so bad. His girlfriend, my son's friend from work, also makes some pretty cool things at Etsy. And I went ahead and went online and bought one of the fidget toys and bought one of the bracelets from her. And it's copper wire work. The bracelet that I got, she has other ones. The one that I got was copper wire work with beads that are chakra colors, which I just, I am attracted to rainbow colors and chakra colors turn out to do what I want them to do. And it's lovely. And so, you know, if you feel like supporting somebody on the Etsiness, that's an idea. I am going to be getting, mom, you need to turn off the episode or just turn the volume down for about five seconds now. Okay, turn it off. Right. Okay. Now that my mom's not listening, I'm going to be getting some stuff for everybody for Christmas from these two Etsy stores. It seems the right thing to do. That was about five seconds. Mom, I hope you're back now. All right. So fidget toys, link in the show notes and free your mandalas, which is the name of my son's friend's Etsy shop where I got the copper wire bracelet. Uh, The link to that store is also in the show notes for you. So some fun stuff to look at and pretty stuff to look at, you know. So get yourself off Pinterest. Go check out Etsy. (laughs) There you go. 
Done. Solved. Sorted. Excellent. Drum Valley Roni. I know I said it wrong, but that's how it's spelled. Drum Valley Roni is a lovely, lovely part of Ireland. On the way from Dublin up to Belfast, in the 2021 Craftlit Tour, we will drive through this unbelievably beautiful part of the world. Drumbally Roni in County Down turns out to be the place where Patrick Bronte was born. And not surprisingly, there is history there. There is also gorgeousness. I, I put a link to a Google search into the show notes, just so you don't have to work very hard to go see some beautiful, beautiful pictures of Ireland. Holy smoke. Craftlet.com slash 543. Holy cow. Green is going to be redefined. It is stunning. And Diane, because she is spectacular. From holiday vacations, she found this lovely little Bronte Family Homeland Interpretive Center. This is where Patrick was born on, I know you're going to be shocked here, born on St. Patrick's Day. Get it? I know. I have no idea what name they had chosen for him before that, but I think that once he was born on St. Patrick's Day, that boat sailed. So there's a, a lovely little historical center. The church there is just lovely. And oh my gosh, I think I was set to say something about this ages ago. The last name Bronte, B-R-O-N-T-E, with the double dots that looks like an umlaut over the top, was not their original name. He fiddled with his last name once he got to Cambridge. So Patrick Bronte had been Patrick Bronte, B-R-U-N-T-Y. He does well in Ireland, gets an opportunity to go study in Cambridge, and started fiddling with his name. And over time, you could see him in uh, letters that he wrote and, and papers that he signed, that he was finding different ways to make his name, I imagine, look a little bit more posh. And Bronte is what he came up with eventually. And then that stuck. So in the village that we will be visiting, he would have been identified as Patrick Bronte. That's about an hour and a half of gorgeous driving up near the coastline, the, the eastern coastline of Ireland. And then just before we get to Belfast, we will go to, well, stop, and then we will go to the Irish Linen Center and Lisburn Museum. Now, this is Lisburn, L-I-S-B-U-R-N. So not Lisbon, L-I-S-B-O-N, which is further south. In Lisburn, there is this incredible Irish Linen Center and Museum. I've put a link in the show notes to their main webpage, but also to their conservation webpage because it shows shows a woman's hands and a little bit of her hair, beautiful, red, not surprising. And she is blocking an Irish linen damask napkin. Then she's not blocking it the way that knitters usually, I'm stressing the usually, block their knitting. It's a different process. It's a slightly different process. Same idea, slightly different process. So it's kind of cool to take a look at the picture. It's also really neat to see this damask linen because it was woven there. And they have people who spin flax and then weave linen from the flax that's been spun. Pretty nifty. So we will be stopping there and taking a look at all of this stuff. If you go, go look at the, the Irish Linen Center and Lisburn Museum website, you will also see if you widen your browser as much as you can, that the background photograph on their page is heartbreakingly beautiful. It's, you know, green fields and lovely little flowers, and it looks like maybe a thatched roof in the background, and it's, uh, just makes me happy is what it does, is it makes me happy. After we leave the Lisburn Museum, we will continue north, not very much longer, and go to Belfast. We will stay at the Grand Central Hotel, which is as grand and central as it sounds to be. And then we will go to Robinson's Bar for dinner. 
Now, I have included a link to Robinson's Bar, and I think there may be a risk that I won't leave <laughs> ever. <laughs> if someone had decided to plan a way to trap and keep me somewhere forever, they would have achieved it with this place. This is this just shows you how well Diane knows me and therefore us. There's a lounge, there's a saloon, there's Fibber McGee's, which is this wonderful place where you can go listen to live Irish folk music seven nights a week. They've got people in there playing. It's so cool looking. I cannot wait to go. They have a lounge with food. They've got everything going on. They have Titanic memorabilia, which you are going to hear more about on another day. And I'm looking, I'm looking at all these pictures just thinking, okay, I'm salivating. I'm sure the food's good, sure. But I'm salivating for going to this place. I don't even have to eat. I don't even have to drink. I could just go and be, be in this place. Maybe, maybe this is part of just being desperate to be around human people. Maybe. But I actually don't think so. I think it's just that I really, really, really like everything about Robinson's Bars. So, yeah. You can go look at the website yourself. Uh, it's easy enough to find, but I did put a link to it in the show notes as well. So you can enjoy the same kind of wistful strolling along through another part of the world that just looks warm and friendly and inviting and, in this case, Irish. So that was my little tour book guide of the Craftlet October 2021 Craftlet trip to Ireland. If you are interested in joining us, it is so easy to do. We are, yeah, we're about three quarters of the way sold now. So don't hesitate. If you even think you might be interested in going, all you have to do is call 888-554-5208 let them know that you want to go on the Ireland trip. Keyword craftlit, C-R-A-F-T-L-I-T. Apparently, it's case specific. So capital C craft, everything else lowercase. And you can type that keyword in at holidayvacations.com. Let them know that this is the experience that you want to join in on. Put $200 down and that's all you have to do right now. That locks your price in, that saves you a spot, and then I don't think the final payment is due until June 29th, 2021. So you've got time, lock in the payment, price is guaranteed at that point, and then we'll get to go to Ireland together. I'm so excited. It is time for these next two chapters of The Tenant of Wildfell Hall. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, indeed. As you can tell, we have been steaming towards what must be the end of the book. And if that was your impression, then you are absolutely correct. When last we left our heroine, Helen was back at Arthur Huntington's bedside. He being ill, having uh, taken a bad fall off of a horse. And it doesn't appear to be movie-wasting disease. It appears that there may have been internal damage, which would, of course, at the time, have been really, really bad. Gilbert, again, as an older person telling this story as part of his history, has been giving us insight into what was going on with Helen because Helen's brother, Lawrence, has been sharing Helen's letters with Gilbert, which is very nice of him. And I, I hope you've been enjoying hearing Maya and Eden reading uh, their appropriate portions of these chapters. It was one of the things that I really liked about the, towards the end of this book, that we get both of their voices so clearly, because the voices are very clear in the writing as well. And it just elucidates that so lovely, in such a lovely way to have uh, real, actual human people voices reading those parts for us. So that's been a real treat. But we know things haven't been going well for Arthur. We also have been, I haven't mentioned this yet, but I know you've been picking up on it. We have been hearing that Gilbert, in his modern state, looking back on all of this, is still in touch with Helen. At least in touch. 
We don't know the final end of their story yet. And we're not going to get the final end of their story yet today. But you'll be able to tell where it's going by the end of the chapters today. However, if you have seen the writing on the wall, you can be fairly confident, and you would be right, that we are going to get one final burst of religious philosophy from Anne Bronte. This is not a surprise, nor is it out of character. It is, however, amazing to watch her argue with herself. I think some of that came from her arguing with Emily, actually. And this is one of those places, this part of the book, is one of those places where the difference between Wuthering Heights and The Tenant of Wildfell Hall could not be more starkly outlined. One of the problems that the Bronte children all wrestled with in various degrees and at various times was how could a loving God be a loving God if God separates you from people who you love who may not have been as pious or as good or as just or as right as God wanted them to be and would therefore separate them in the forever after? How does that work? How can that be love? And they really, this wasn't theoretical. This was what's going to happen next. And part of that was how heavenly can heaven be if people who you want to be with can't be there? These are really tough questions for kids to have been asking and tough questions to wrestle with, especially when somebody is very, very ill in bed and, and you got issues with them and they've got issues with you, it's not going to be easy. You will hear Bible verses flung here, hither and yon throughout the chapter. You'll hear parts of Matthew, parts of John, some Psalms. I think there's a proverb thrown in there. I think we got some Corinthians going. To spice it up, we've got some Faust, Marlowe's Faust. There's a lot of sub-referencing going on in these two chapters. Do you need to know any of it to have it make sense? No. However, one of the stories that is being sub-referenced in there was actually in the show Godspell, which I was in while I was in high school. And it made me smile because it's one of my stories that I did in the show with you know the other actors playing out the parts that I was telling. And it was the first time that I had to do a Brooklyn accent. <laughs> <laughs> so this comes from, un unlike everything else, the, the version that is used in the show is, the text is mostly the book of Matthew. This one actually comes from Luke chapter 16, verses 19 through 31. So it goes like this. There was a certain rich man, and he was clothed in purple and fine linen, and he ate sumptuously every day. And there was also this certain beggar named Lazarus who sat at the gate by the rich man's door, covered in sores, oozing. And he tried, he cried, he begged to be fed with the crumbs that fell from the rich man's table. It was so bad the dogs would come and lick his sores, at which point everyone on stage in Godspell goes, ew. And so it came to pass that the beggar died, and he was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died. And he was buried. And he was in hell. And when he was in hell, he lift up his eyes from his place of torment. And above him he sees Abraham far off in heaven. And Lazarus is there in the bosom of Abraham. And the rich man cries out and says, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. For I am tormented in this flame. Father Abraham looks down and says, Son, remember, in your lifetime, you received all the good things. Likewise, in lifetime, Lazarus received evil things. But now he is comforted. And you, you're being tormented. And beside all this, between us, there is a great gulf fixed. So that anyone who might want to pass from here to there cannot. Neither can your people pass up to us. It's not going to happen. Then the rich man says, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldst send him to my father's house. For I have five brothers, and he can testify to them, lest they also come to this place of torment. 
Abraham said unto him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. The rich man says, No, Father Abraham, but if one went to him from the dead, they would all repent. And Abraham said to the rich man, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, they won't be persuaded through one who rose from the dead either. That's the Brooklyn Stylings of Father Abraham, brought to you by Heather Ordover. I love that story. I love it on many, many levels. It also makes me laugh because that is such a Jewish ending to the story. It's like, listen, if you're not going to listen to Moses in the Book of the Prophets, forget it. It's over. You're not going to pay attention to anything. Forget it. Ah, uh, Brooklyn. Brooklyn's an interesting state of mind as well as a place. You will hear the Lazarus reference come up a couple of times. The other thing that is sub-referenced several times is Faust, which I mentioned. One of the lines that is sub-referenced more directly than others is that in the Marlowe's Faustus, Faust says, I think hell's a fable. And Mephistopheles, always the funny one, says, I, and you will think it so, tell experience change thy mind. And then towards the end of the play Faust, as he realizes at the end with more and more panic what he has done in selling him his soul to the devil, one of his lines is, the devil will come now and Faustus must be damned, realizing that there is no way out of this one, Bubba. And then at one point, there's a conversation about repenting and whether you can repent. And his line is, my heart is hardened. I cannot repent. You're going to hear echoes of those concepts and those words in today's last chapter. Along with all of this, it's important to remember that Anne Bronte had her own understanding of biblical text. She believed in universal redemption, that there is no way that anyone whose heart is really in it, there's no way that you couldn't find a way to find redemption somehow. There's always got to be a way. She couldn't accept God without that. So let's listen to chapters 48 and 49 of The Tenant of Wildfell Hall by Anne Bronte, read for us by Eden Ballantyne and Maya Daguerre. Here we go. Chapter 48, Further Intelligence. Five or six days after this, Mr. Lawrence paid us the honour of a call, and when he and I were alone together, which I contrived as soon as possible by bringing him out to look at my corn stacks, he showed me another letter from his sister. This one he was quite willing to submit to my longing gaze. He thought, I suppose, it would do me good. The only answer it gave to my message was this. Mr. Markham is at liberty to make such revelation concerning me as he judges necessary. He will know that I should wish but little said on the subject. I hope he is well, but tell him he must not think of me. I can give you a few extracts from the rest of the letter. For I was permitted to keep this also perhaps as an antidote to all pernicious hopes and fancies. He is decidedly better, but very low from the depressing effects of his severe illness and the strict regime he is obliged to observe, so opposite to all his previous habits. It is deplorable to see how completely his past life has degenerated his once noble constitution and vitiated the whole system of his organisation, but the doctor says he may now be considered out of danger, if you will only continue to observe the necessary restrictions. Some stimulating cordials he must have, but they should be judiciously diluted and sparingly used, and I find it very difficult to keep him to this. At first his extreme dread of death rendered the task an easy one, but in proportion, as he feels his acute suffering abating and sees the danger receding, the more intractable he becomes. Now also his appetite for food is beginning to return, and here too his long habits of self-indulgence are greatly against him. I watch and restrain him as well as I can, and often get bitterly abused for my rigid severity. And sometimes he contrives to elude my vigilance, and sometimes acts in open opposition to my will. But he is now so completely reconciled to my attendance in general that he is never satisfied when I am not by his side. I'm obliged to be a little stiff with him sometimes, or he would make a complete slave of me. 
and I know it will be unpardonable weakness to give up all other interests for him, and I have the servants to overlook, and my little Arthur to attend to, and my own health too, all of which will be entirely neglected were I to satisfy his exorbitant demands. I do not generally sit up at nights, for I think the nurse who has made it her business is better qualified for such undertakings than I am, but still an unbroken night's rest is what I but seldom enjoy, and never can venture to reckon upon, for my patient makes no scruple of calling me upon any hour when his wants or his fancies require my presence. But he is manifestly afraid of my displeasure, and if at one time he tries my patience by his unreasonable extractions and fretful complaints and reproaches, at another he depresses me by his abject submission and deprecatory self-abasement when he fears that he has gone too far. But all this I can readily pardon. I know it is chiefly the result of his enfeebled frame and disordered nerves. What annoys me the most is his occasional attempts at affectionate fondness that I can neither credit nor return. Not that I hate him. His sufferings and my own laborious care have given him some claim to my regard, to my affection even, if he would only be quiet and sincere and content to let things remain as they are. But the more he tries to conciliate me, the more I shrink from him and from the future. Helen, what do you mean to do when I get well? he asked this morning. Will you run away again? It entirely depends upon your own conduct. Oh, I'll be very good. But if I find it necessary to leave you, Arthur, I shall not run away. You know I now have your promise that I may go whenever I please and take my son with me. Oh, but you shall have no cause. And then followed a variety of professions which I rather coldly checked. Will you not forgive me then? said he. Yes, I have forgiven you, but I know you cannot love me as you once did, and I should be very sorry if you were to, for I could not pretend to return it, so let us drop the subject and never occur to it again. By what I have done for you, you may judge of what I will do, if it may not be incompatible with the higher duty I owe to my son, higher because he never forfeited his claims, and because I hope to do more good to him than I can ever do to you. And if you wish me to feel kindly towards you, it is deeds, not words, that must purchase my affection and esteem. His sole reply to this was a slight grimace and scarcely perceptible shrug. Alas, unhappy man, words with him are so much cheaper than deeds. It was as if I had said, pounds not pence must buy the article you want. And then he sighed, a querulous, self-commiserating sigh, as if in pure regret that he, the loved and courted of so many worshippers, should now be abandoned to the mercy of a harsh, extracting, cold-hearted woman like that, and even glad of what kindness she chose to bestow. "'It's a pity, isn't it?' said I, and whether I rightly divined his musings or not, the observation chimed in with his thoughts, for he answered, "'It can't be helped,' with a rueful smile at my penetration. "'I have seen Esther Hargrave twice. "'She is a charming creature, but her blithe spirit is almost broken, "'and her sweet temper almost spoiled "'by the still unremitting persecutions of her mother "'in behalf of her rejected suitor, "'not violent, but wearisome and unremitting like a continual dropping. "'The unnatural parent seemed determined to make her daughter's life a burden "'if she will not yield to her desires.' "'Mamma does all she can,' said she, "'to make me feel myself a burden and encumbrance to the family, "'and the most ungrateful, selfish and undutiful daughter that was ever born. "'And Walter, too, is as stern and cold and haughty as if he hated me outright. "'I believe I should have yielded at once "'if I had known from the beginning how much resistance it would have cost me. "'But now, for very obstinacy's sake, I will stand out.' "'A bad motive for a good resolve,' I answered, but, however, I know you have better motives, really, for your perseverance, and I counsel you to keep them still in view. Trust me, I will. I threaten Mamma sometimes that I'll run away and disgrace the family by earning my own livelihood if she torments me any more. And then that frightens her a little. But I will do, in good earnest, if they don't mind. Be quiet and patient a while, said I. The better times will come. Poor girl! I wish somebody that was worthy to possess her would come and take her away, don't you, Frederick?
if the perusal of this letter filled me with dismay for Helen's future life and mine, there was one great source of consolation. It was now in my power to clear her name from every foul aspersion. The Millwards and the Wilsons should see with their own eyes the bright sun bursting from the cloud, and they should be scorched and dazzled by its beams, and my own friends should see it. They whose suspicions had been such gall and wormwood to my soul. To effect this I had only to drop the seed into the ground, and it would become a stately branching herb. A few words to my mother and sister I knew would suffice to spread the news throughout the whole neighbourhood without any further exertion on my part. Rose was delighted, and as soon as I had told her all I thought proper, which was all I affected to know, she flew with altricity to put on her bonnet and shawl, and hastened to carry the glad tidings to the Millwards and Wilsons. Glad tidings, I suspect, to none but herself and Mary Millward, that steady, sensible girl, whose sterling worth had been so quickly perceived and duly valued by the supposed Mrs. Graham, in spite of her plain outside, and who, on her part, had been better able to appreciate the lady's true character and qualities than the brightest genius among them. As I may never have occasion to mention her again, I may as well tell you here that she was at this time privately engaged to Richard Wilson, a secret, I believe, to everyone but themselves. That worthy student was now at Cambridge, where his most exemplary conduct and his diligent perseverance in the pursuit of learning carried him safely through, and eventually brought him, with hard-earned honours, and an untarnished reputation, to the close of his collegiate career. In due time, he became Mr. Mulwood's first and only curate, for that gentleman's declining years forced him to at last acknowledge that the duties of his extensive parish were a little too much for those vaulting energies which he was wont to boast over his younger and less active brethren of the cloth. This was what the patient, faithful lovers had privately planned, and quietly waited for years ago. And in due time, they were united, to the astonishment of the little world they lived in, that they had long since declared them both to single blessedness, affirming it impossible that the pale, retiring bookworm should ever summon the courage to seek a wife, or be able to obtain one if he did, and equally impossible that the plain-looking, plain-dealing, unattractive, unconsolating Miss Woolwood should ever find a husband. They still continued to live at the vicarage, the lady dividing a time between her father, her husband, and the poor parishioners, and subsequently her rising family. And now that the Reverend Michael Millward had been gathered to his father's, full of years and honours. The Reverend Richard Wilson had succeeded him to the vicarage of Linden Hope, greatly to the satisfaction of its inhabitants, who had so long tried and full provided his merits, and those of his excellent and well-loved partner. If you are interested in the after-fate of that lady's sister, I can tell you, what perhaps you have heard from another quarter, that some twelve or thirteen years ago, she relieved the happy couple of her presence, by marrying a wealthy tradesman of Leeds, and I don't envy him his bargain. I fear she leads him a rather uncomfortable life, though happily he is too dull to perceive the extent of his misfortune. I have little enough to do with her myself. We have not met for many years, but I am well assured that she has not yet forgotten or forgiven either her former lover, or the lady whose superior qualities first opened his eyes to the folly of his boyish attachment. As for Richard Wilson's sister, she, having been wholly unable to recapture Mr. Lawrence, or obtain any partner rich and elegant enough to suit her idea of what the husband of Jane Wilson ought to be, is yet in her single blessedness. Shortly after the death of her mother, she withdrew the light of her presence from Rycourt Farm, finding it impossible any longer to endure the rough manners and unsophisticated habits of her honest brother Robert and his worthy wife, or the idea of being identified with such vulgar people in the eyes of the world, and took lodgings in Hebden Bridge, the county town where she lived, and still lives, I suppose, in a kind of close-fisted, cold and comfortable, genteel, doing no good to others but little to herself, spending her days in fancy work and scandal, referring frequently to her brother the vicar and her sister the vicar's wife, but never to her brother the farmer and her sister the farmer's wife, seeing as much company as she can without too much expense, but loving no one, 
and beloved by none. A cold-hearted, supercilious, keenly, insidiously sensuous old maid. Chapter 49 Though Mr Lawrence's health was now quite re-established, my visits to Woodford were as unremitting as ever, though often less protracted than before. We seldom talked about Mrs Huntingdon, but yet we never met without mentioning her, for I never sought his company, but without the hope of hearing something about her. And he never sought mine at all, because he saw me often enough without. But I always began to talk of other things, and waited to see if he would be the first to introduce the subject. If he did not, I would casually ask, Have you heard from your sister lately? If he said no, the matter was dropped. If he said yes, would venture to inquire, How is she? But never, how is her husband? Though I might be burning to know, because I had not the hypocrisy to profess any anxiety for his recovery, and I had not the face to express any desire for a contrary result. Had I such desire? I fear I must plead guilty. But since you have heard my confession, you must hear my justification as well. A few of the excuses, at least, wherein I sought to pacify my own accusing conscience. In the first place, you see, his life did harm to others, and evidently no good to himself. And though I wished it to terminate, I would not have hastened it close if, by the lifting of a finger, I could have done so, or if a spirit had whispered it in my ear that a single effort of the will would be enough, unless, indeed, I had the power to exchange him for some other victim of the grave, whose life might be of service to his race, or whose death might be lamented by his friends. But was there any harm in wishing that? among the many thousands of souls whose certainty would require of them before the year was over, this wretched mortal might be one. I thought not, and therefore I wished with all my heart that it might please heaven to remove him to a better world, or if that might not be, still to take him out of this. For if he were unfit to answer the summons now, after a warning sickness, and with such an angel by his side, it seemed but too certain that he never would be. That, on the contrary, returning health will bring returning lust and villainy, and as he grew more certain of recovery, more accustomed to her generous goodness, his feelings will become more callous, his heart more flinty, and impervious to her persuasive arguments. But God knew best. Meantime, however, I could not but be anxious for the result of his decrees, knowing as I did that... Leaving myself entirely out of the question, however Helen might feel interested in her husband's welfare, however she might deplore his fate, still, while he lived, she must be miserable. A fortnight passed away, and my inquiries were always answered in the negative. At length, a welcome yes drew from me the second question. Lawrence divined my anxious thoughts and appreciated my reserve. I feared at first, he was going to torture me by unsatisfactory replies, and either leave me quite in the dark concerning what I wanted to know, or forcing me to drag the information out of him, morsel by morsel, by direct inquiries. And serves you right, you will say. But he was more merciful, and in a little while he put his sister's letter in my hand. I silently read it, and restored it to him without comment or remark. This mode of procedure suited him so well, and thereafter, he always pursued this plan of showing me her letters at once, when inquired after her, if there were any to show. It was so much less trouble than to tell me their contents, and I received such confidence so quietly and discreetly that he was never induced to discontinue them. But I devoured those precious letters with my eyes, and never let them go till their contents were stamped upon my mind, and when I got home... The most important passages were entered in my diary among the remarkable events of the day. The first of these communications brought intelligence of a serious relapse in Mr Huntingdon's illness, entirely the result of his own infatuation in persisting in the indulgence of his appetite for the stimulating drink. In vain had she remonstrated, in vain had she mingled his wine with water, her arguments her and entreaties were a nuisance, her interference 
was an insult so intolerable that at length, on finding she had covertly diluted the pale port that was brought to him, he threw the bottle out of the window, swearing he'd not be cheated like a baby, ordering the butler, on pain of instant dismissal, to bring him a bottle of the strongest wine in the cellar, and affirming that he should have been well long ago if he had been let to have his own way. But she wanted to keep him weak in order that she might have him under her thumb. But, by the Lord Harry, he would have no more humbug, seizing a glass in one hand and a bottle in the other, and never resting till he had drunk it dry. Alarming symptoms were the immediate result of his impudence, as she mildly termed it. Symptoms which had rather increased than diminished since. And this was the cause of the delay in writing to her brother. Every former feature of his malady had returned with augmented virulence. The slight external wound, half healed, had broken out afresh. The internal inflammation had taken place, which might terminate fatally if not removed. Of course, the wretched sufferer's temper was not improved by this calamity. In fact, I suspect, it was why Nell insupportable. Though his kind nurse did not complain, but she said she had been obliged at last to give her son in charge to Esther Hargreave, as her presence was so constantly required in the sick room that she could not possibly attend to him herself, and though the child had begged to be allowed to continue with her there, and to help her nurse his papa, and though she had no doubt he would have been very good and quiet, she could not think of subjecting his young and tender feelings to the sight of so much suffering, or of allowing him to witness his father's impatience, or hear the dreadful language he was wont to use in his paroxysms of pain or irritation. The latter most deeply regrets the steps that has occasioned his relapse, but as usual he throws the blame upon me. If I had reasoned with him like a rational creature, he said, it never would have happened. But to be treated like a baby or a fool was enough to put any man past his patience and drive him to assert his independence, even at the sacrifice of his own interests. He forgets how often I had reasoned him past his patience before. He appears to be sensible of his danger, but nothing can induce him to behold it in the proper light. The other night, when I was waiting on him, and just as I brought him a draught to assuage his burning thirst, he observed, with a return of his former sarcastic bitterness, "'Yes, you're mighty attentive now. I suppose there's nothing you wouldn't do for me now.' "'You know,' said I, a little surprised at his manner, "'that I'm willing to do anything I can to relieve you.' "'Yes, now, my immaculate angel, uh, but only when you have secured your regard and find yourself safe in heaven, and me howling in hellfire, catch you lifting a finger to serve me then.' No, you'll look complacently on, and not so much dip the tip of your finger in water to cool my tongue. If so, it will be because of the great gulf over which I cannot pass, and if I could look complacently on in such a case, it would be only from the assurance that you were being purified from your sins, and fitted to enjoy the happiness I felt. But are you determined, Arthur, that I shall not meet you in heaven? Oh, what should I do there, I should like to know? Indeed, I cannot tell you, and I fear it is too certain that your tastes and feelings must be wildly altered before you can have any enjoyment there. But do you prefer sinking without an effort into the state of torment that you picture to yourself? Thou, it is a fable, said he contemptuously. Are you sure, Arthur? Are you quite sure? Because if there's any doubt, if you should find yourself mistaken after all, when it is too late to turn... It would be rather awkward, to be sure, said he. But don't bother me now, I'm not going to die yet. I can't and won't, he added vehemently, as if suddenly struck with the appalling aspect of that terrible event. Helen, you must save me. And he earnestly seized my hand and looked into my face with such imploring eagerness that my heart bled for him and I could not speak for tears. The next letter brought intelligence that the malady was fast increasing and the poor sufferer's horror of death was still more distressing than his impatience of bodily pain. All his friends had not forsaken him, for Mr Hattersley, hearing of his danger, had come to see him from his distant home in the north. His wife had accompanied him, as much for the pleasure of seeing her dear friend, from whom she had been parted so long, as to visit her mother and sister. Mrs Huntingdon expressed herself glad to see Millicent once more, 
and pleased to behold her so happy and well. She is now at the Grove, but she often calls to see me. Mr Hattersley spends much of his time at Arthur's bedside, with more good feeling than I gave him credit for. He evinces his considerable sympathy for his unhappy friend, and is far more willing than able to comfort him. Sometimes he tries to joke and laugh with him, but that will not do. Sometimes he endeavours to cheer him with talk of old times, and this at one time may serve to divert the sufferer from his own sad thoughts, and another it will only plunge him into deeper melancholy than before. And then Hattersley is confounded and knows not what to say, unless it be a timid suggestion that the clergyman might be sent for. But Arthur will never consent to that. He knows that he's rejected the clergyman's well-meant admonitions with scoffing levity as other times. He cannot dream of turning to him for consolation now. Mr Hattersley sometimes offers his services instead of mine, but Arthur will not let me go. That strange whim still increases as his strength declines. The fancy to have me always by his side. I hardly ever leave him, except to go into the next room, where I sometimes snatch an hour or so of sleep when he is quiet, but even then the door is left ajar that he might know me to be within call. I'm with him now while I write, and I fear my occupation annoys him, though I frequently break it off to attend to him, and though Mr Hattersley is also by his side. That gentleman came, as he said, to beg a holiday for me, that I might have a run in the park this fine frosty morning with Millicent and Esther and little Arthur, whom he has driven over to see me. Our poor invalid evidently felt it a heartless proposition, and would have felt it still more heartless in me to accede to it, and therefore I said I would only go to speak to them a minute and then come back. I did exchange but a few words with them just outside the portico, inhaling the fresh bracing air as I stood, and then... Resisting the earnest and eloquent entreaties of all three to stay a little longer and join them in a walk round the garden, I tore myself away and returned to my patient. I had not been absent five minutes, but he reproached me bitterly for my levity and neglect. His friend espoused my cause. Nay, nay, Huntington, said he. You're too hard upon her. She must have food and sleep and a mouthful of fresh air now and then, or she can't stand it, I tell you. Look at her man, she's worn to a shadow already. What are her sufferings to mine? said the poor invalid. You don't grudge me these attentions, do you, Helen? No, Arthur, if I could really serve you by them, I would give my life to save you if I might. Would you indeed? No. Most willingly I would. Ah, oh, that's because you think yourself more fit to die. There was a painful pause. He was evidently plunged into gloomy reflections but while I pondered for something to say that might benefit without alarming him, Hattersley, whose mind had been pursuing almost the same course, broke silence with, I say, Huntington, I would send for a parson of some sort. If you didn't like the vicar, you know, you could have his curate or somebody else. No, none of them can benefit me if she can't, was the answer, and the tears gushed from his eyes as he earnestly exclaimed, Oh, Helen, if I'd listened to you, it never would have come to this, and if I'd heard you long ago, oh God, how different it would have been. Hear me now then, Arthur, said I, gently pressing his hand. It's too late now, said he despondently, and after that another paroxysm of pain came on, and then his mind began to wander. We feared his death was approaching, but an opiate was administered. His sufferings began to abate, he gradually became more composed, and at length sank into a kind of slumber. He has been quieter since, and now Hattersley has left him, expressing a hope that he should find him better when he calls tomorrow. Perhaps I may recover, he replied. Who knows? This may have been the crisis. What do you think, Helen? Unwilling to depress him, I gave him the most cheering answer I could, but still recommended him to prepare for the possibility of what I inly feared was but too certain. But he was determined to hope. Shortly after, he relapsed into a kind of doze, but now he groans again. There is a change. Suddenly, he called me to his side with such a strange, excited manner that I feared he was delirious, but he was not. That was the crisis, Helen, he said delightedly. I had an infernal pain here. It is quite gone now. 
I never was so easy since the fall, quite gone by heaven. Then he clasped and kissed my hand in the very fullness of his heart, but finding I did not participate in his joy, he quickly flung it from him and bitterly cursed my coldness and insensibility. How could I reply? Kneeling beside him, I took his hand and fondly pressed it to my lips for the first time since our separation, and told him, as well as tears would let me speak, that it was not that that kept me silent. It was the fear that this sudden cessation of pain was not as so favourable a symptom as he supposed. I immediately sent for the doctor. We are now anxiously awaiting him. I will tell you what he says. There is still the same freedom from pain, the same deadness to all sensation where the suffering was most acute. My worst fears are realised. Mortification has commenced. The doctor has told him there is no hope. No words can describe this anguish. I can write no more. The next was still more distressing in the tenor of its contents. The sufferer was fast approaching dissolution. Dragged almost to the verge of that awful chasm he trembled to contemplate, from which no agony of prayer or tears could save him. Nothing could comfort him now. Hattersley's rough attempts at consolation were utterly in vain. The world was nothing to him. Life and all its interests, its petty cares and transient pleasures, were a cruel mockery. To talk of the past was to torture him with vain remorse. To refer to the future was to increase his anguish. And yet to be silent was to leave him a prey to his own regrets and apprehensions. Often he dwelt with shuddering minuteness on the fate of his perishing clay, the slow piecemeal dissolution already invading his frame, the shroud, the coffin, the dark, lonely grave, and all the horrors of corruption. If I try to divert him from these things, to raise his thoughts to higher themes, it is no better. Worse and worse, he groans. If there be really life beyond the tomb and judgment after death, how can I face it? I cannot do him any good. He will neither be enlightened nor roused nor comforted by anything I say, and yet he clings to me with unrelenting pertinacity, with a kind of childish desperation, as if I could save him from the fate he dreads. He keeps me night and day beside him. He is holding my left hand now while I write. He has held it thus for hours, sometimes quietly with his pale face upturned to mine, sometimes clutching my arm with violence, the big drops starting from his forehead at the thought of what he sees or what he thinks he sees before him. If I withdraw my hand for a moment, it distresses him. Stay with me, Helen, he says. Let me hold you so. It seems as if harm could not reach me while you are here. But death will come. It is coming now. Fast, fast. And oh... I could believe there was nothing after. Don't try to believe it, Arthur. There is joy and glory after, and if you will but try to reach it. What for me? he said, with something like a laugh. Are we not to be judged according to the deeds done in the body? Where's the use of a probationary existence if a man may spend it as he pleases, just contrary to God's decrees, and then go to heaven with the best, if the vilest sinner may win reward for the holiest saint? by merely saying, I repent. But if you sincerely repent, I can't repent. I only fear. You only regret the past for its consequences to yourself. Just so, except that I am sorry to have wronged you, Nell, because you're so good to me. Think of the goodness of God, and you cannot but be grieved to have offended him. What is God? I cannot see him or hear him. God is only an idea. God is infinite wisdom and power and goodness and love. But if his idea is too vast for your human faculties, if your mind loses itself in its overwhelming infinitude, fix it on him who condescends to take our nature upon him, who was raised to heaven, even in his glorified human body, in whom the fullness of the Godhead shines. But he only shook his head and sighed. Then... In another paroxysm of shuddering horror, he tightened his grasp on my hand and arm, and groaning and lamenting still clung to me with that wild desperate earnestness, so harrowing to my soul because I know I cannot help him. I did my best to soothe and comfort him. Death is so terrible, he cried. I cannot bear it. 
You do not know, Helen. You can't imagine what it is because you haven't it before you. And when I'm buried, you'll return to your old ways and be as happy as ever. And all the world will go on just as busy and merry as if I'd never been. Well, I... He burst into tears. You needn't let that distress you, said I. We shall all follow you soon enough. I wish to God I could take you with me now, he exclaimed. You should plead for me. No man can deliver his brother more make an agreement unto God for him, I replied. It costs more to redeem their souls. It costs the blood of an incarnate God, perfect and sinless in himself, to redeem us from the bondage of the evil one. Let him plead for you. But I seem to speak in vain. He does not now, as formerly, laugh these blessed truths to scorn. But still he cannot trust nor will not comprehend them. He cannot linger long. He suffers dreadfully, and so do those that wait upon him. But I will not harass you further with details. I have said enough, I think, to convince you that I did well to go to him. Poor, poor Helen. Dreadful indeed her trials must have been. And I could do nothing to lessen them. Nay, it almost seemed as if I had brought them upon her myself, by my own secret desires. Whether I looked at her husband's suffering or her own, it seemed almost like a judgment upon myself for having cherished such a wish. The next day but one, there came another letter. That too was put into my hands without a remark, and these are its contents. December 5th. He is gone at last. I sat beside him all night, with my hand fast locked in his, watching the changes of his features, and listening to his failing breath. He had been silent a long time, and I thought he would never speak again, when he murmured, faintly but distinctly, Pray for me, Helen. I do pray for you, every hour and every minute, Arthur, but you must pray for yourself. His lips moved, but emitted no sound. Then his looks became unsettled, and, from the incoherent, half-uttered words, that escaped him from time to time, supposing him now to be unconscious, I gently and disengaged my hand from his, intending to steal away for a breath of fresh air, for I was almost ready to faint. But a compulsive movement of his fingers, and a faintly whispered, Don't leave me, immediately recalled me. I took his hand again, and held it till he was no more, and then I fainted. It was not grief, it was exhaustion that till then I had been enabled successfully to combat. Oh, Frederick, none can imagine the miseries, bodily and mental, of that deathbed. How could I endure to think that that poor trembling soul was hurried away to everlasting torment? It would drive me mad. But thank God I have hope, not only from a vague dependence on the possibility that penitence and pardon might have reached him at the last but from blessed confidence that though whatever purging fires the erring spirit may be doomed to pass, whatever fate awaits it, still it is not lost, and God who hates nothing that he hath made will bless it in the end. His body is to be consigned on Thursday to that dark grave he so much dreaded, but the coffin must be closed as soon as possible. If you will attend the funeral, come quickly, for I need help. Helen Huntington. All right. You were waiting for it. I know you were. I was. We were all waiting for it. And now it happened. You heard the Anne Bronteism at the end, where Anne has Helen in her letter saying, I have hope not only from a vague dependence on the possibility that penitence and pardon might have reached him at the last, but from the blessed confidence that through whatever purging fires the erring spirit may be doomed to pass, whatever fate awaits it, still it is not lost. And God, who hateth nothing that he hath made, will bless it in the end. There is an emphasis on the word will. <laughs> this is 100% Anne Bronte. And, interestingly, the coffin must be closed as soon as possible, if you will attend the funeral, come quickly for I need help. I don't think we've ever heard Helen say anything like that that directly. I need help. She tried to come up with ways to get out and 
enlisted her brother's aid, like, could you get Wildfell Hall set for me, please? That's different from saying, come quickly, I need help. So we have a bit of a cliffhanger here, because why? I mean, Arthur's gone, so yay! I could understand if she meant, come quickly, I need help, to throw a raging party, but I'm pretty sure that is not what she meant. So, so, haha, there we are. Arthur, sorted. Gilbert, still interesting. Still a little bit more self-aware than I would have expected him to grow up into being, so that was nice. And little Arthur is not going to have to grow up with that horrible father figure. So, wins all around. Next week we find out what Helen needed help with. And there we'll go. All right, I'm going to let you go for now. Take care of yourself. Take care of each other. Wear a mask. Be well. I'll talk to you soon. Bye. If you like what you heard today, please leave a review over at iTunes. Join us on Facebook. Meet up with the knitters on Craftlet's Corner of Ravelry. Stay in the know on Instagram or add your name to our mailing list, which I promise will never spam you. In fact, you probably want to buy a lottery ticket on any day that you get a message from the Craftlet mailing list because that'll be a special day. And remember, if your hands are too busy to pick up a book, at least you can turn one on.